So I'd like to introduce our guest speaker tonight, um, but before I do, did you all pick up your cards and everything that you need to know about the next couple of meetings? So Dr. Diane Coffey, who is here tonight, Dr. Coffey, can you wave? She will talk to us about osteoporosis and why exercise is important for that. Okay, so let me introduce our speaker who comes to us from the Chattanooga area. Dr. Greg Steinke is graduated from medical school at Loma Linda University in Loma Linda, California, with additional training in public health and nutrition. He then completed four years of additional training at Loma Linda University to become, a board, to become board certified in family and preventive medicine, with an emphasis in lifestyle medicine. On top of his medical practice, Dr. Greg regularly conducts community-based lifestyle education programs, kind of like what we have tonight, designed to reverse and improve chronic diseases such as heart disease, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, depression, and tobacco uh, dependence. Dr. Stanky has co-authored the best-selling book, 30 Days to Natural Blood Pressure, Right here, I actually have it in my um, library. Uh, and he also had a position statement by the American College of Lifestyle Medicine on diabetes re remission. So he is also a regular contributor to the American Board of Lifestyle Medicine exam questioning writing team. So Dr. Gregg grew up in Canada, where I grew up. And guess what? We found out that we're shirt tail relatives. <laughs> Is that not crazy? <laughs> when I saw his name, I said, oh, I remember that from Canada. And then when I saw his, his autobiography, or his uh, bio, I said, oh my goodness, for real, okay. So that's interesting. So he grew up in Canada, but he is now um, in Southern Tennessee in the Chattanooga area. He's married to Heather, they met, on a medical mission trip in Africa, Nigeria, Africa. They have two children, and um, I'm just very thankful that he has agreed to come all this way to speak to us tonight. So Dr. Stanky. All right, we're, ooh, there we go, this is great. You know, our, our church back in, uh, Chattanooga now has uh, Jeremy and Tina Arnold, uh, who, if, if some of you may know, were, used to be the pastors at this church, and so we're grateful. All right, so um, Rhoda asked me to uh, give a little devotional before I started my talk, so I just wanted to share a couple things that relate to uh, brain-gut interactions, but before we start that, let's just go ahead and have a prayer. Dear Lord, we're just grateful for your hand in our lives, and uh, we're just uh, want, longing to learn how we can both improve our brains, improve our health, um, understand the ex enormous uh, involvement of our guts with these details, um, so that we most importantly can conduct our lives better, so that we can understand um, the great themes that uh, I know you're longing us for us to know in our lives, to, to discover meaning, um, deeper uh, understanding of, of how this world was made and, and how you work. So we just pray that um, you'll be with us to this evening. In your name I pray, amen. When I was a teenager, I grew up in a secular home. My parents were not religious. I... Um, started learning about health principles. My grandfather um, was a physician, and I didn't really know him, and my grandfather um, wanted to get to know his grandchildren, 
and he was from California, and so they started to visit us during the summers. And my mom wasn't particularly uh, interested in that idea because my grandparents are very religious, and, uh, and it created some conflict. But um, what my grandparents proceeded to do was to um, begin to share with us um, many health principles. And it's interesting as you begin to learn health principles and as you begin to improve your lifestyle that there's almost like a spiritual awakening that occurs in your life. Has anyone experienced that? I know I personally went through that. And so I remember um, beginning to change my, my lifestyle and starting to read books. And there was one particular detail that, uh, that I, I, partic- I had a, a lot of conflict with my own mom over. And that's that I had chosen because of reading this book called Don't Drink Your Milk. You know, uh, I, I had heard that maybe there were some issues there that I had stopped, to ta- stopped taking dairy. Well, you, you have to understand, my dad was a dairy farmer, you know, uh, you know, before he, you know, had us. And so we would drink a gallon of milk a day. And it was probably in excess. But anyways, I stopped doing that, and my mom, uh, you know, decided to, uh, that she wasn't going to let her children not have the healthy thing that, that they needed. And so I remember her setting a glass of milk in front of me every day <laughs> for a while there and trying to force me to drink it down. But it's funny when you're a teenager, it just doesn't work very long, right? <laughs> and, uh, and she kind of gave up on that. But what happened um, personally was that as I started to improve my lifestyle, I started eating more fruits and vegetables, um, we cut the meat out of our lives, I um, started improving um, our, our diets and, and getting, uh, uh, you know, more, um, you know, uh, whole plant foods in our lifestyle, uh, plenty of exercise, that uh, I started uh, having improvements in my own character and soul. I started to care about, um, you know, addiction and drinking and all the stuff we were doing as teenagers. You know how teenagers are you know, all the, uh, the vice that we like to do. Uh, and, and I had that experience of a healthy body requires a healthy soul, and a healthy soul requires a healthy body. And I thought that was particularly uh, meaningful as I, I went ahead and started changing my life. I, I was very much dedicated to, um, you know, before I changed my life, uh, to you know, sports and, and to, to those kind of things, but I, I started to long for a greater meaning in my life, to have uh, a sense of a humanitarian effort, to help others. Uh, that became a, a prominent theme, and that eventually led me to switch into a much different effort in my life, and that's why I'm a physician today. But, you know, um, if, when you think about um, the spiritual side of it and, and from a Christian perspective, um, you think of verses like John uh, six thirty five that says, uh, Jesus speaking, I am the bread of life. I, he who comes to me shall never hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. And so that verse is speaking both of your physical eating and something that occurs when you eat food, and it goes in your gut, and then it begins to have an effect on your body that t- it turn, food turns into flesh, which I find absolutely fascinating. Versus here, Jesus is particularly speaking of a spiritual concept that somehow spiritually, if you eat bread, spiritually speaking, and Jesus is speaking uh, of his own self, because later in that same section in John 6:54, it says, whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. And this was a very unpopular teaching. I mean, many of his followers left him after he made this teaching, and he was not meaning for them to actually eat his body, you know, literally. He was speaking uh, of about a spiritual concept that he wanted his followers and, and, and different people to understand that there's a spiritual uh, process that occurs when you begin to consume mentally different things than you had before. If you consume uh, things that are healthy for your brain, you know, I mean, when you think about the organs in our body that are primarily have to do with, you know, inputs and outputs, you think of your brain and your gut, right? The input of what you're putting in your brain changes what the output is, spiritually speaking. You know, 
uh, emotionally speaking. The, um, the input of the food changes what the, um, what, what the uh, output is uh, with your gut. So here's our clinic when we first started. Um, we, we run LifeMed Clinic at, um, down in Chattanooga, and here's our staff today. So we're two years old now, and we're growing rapidly, and it's been a really uh, a fun experience to, um, to uh, run this clinic and to do it in a way that I think is, is a lot more friendly to patients. So the brain-gut uh, axis, establishing the connection, that's um, what we're going to talk about today. So I want to, you know, you, you, we've touched on a little bit of the spiritual ideas, but I want to just establish uh, in a deeper way some of these physical connections so you can understand um, why uh, physiologically some of these things are going on. So what we're going to do in this um, talk is I'm going to share with you a, a, what I call a gutsy history lesson. Then we'll talk about the brain-gut axis itself, just to introduce it to you. Um, we're going to talk booty to brain, a bottom-up communication. So as it turns out, there's a lot of communication that's occurring from the gut going up to your brain. It's a fan fascinating concept. Um, what makes a great microbiome? Um, we'll get into that. Uh, food factors in the microbiome, and then lastly, stress in your gut. So hopefully we'll have time to get into all those, at least uh, preliminarily. Okay, so um, the, the story I want to share with you, uh, but well, actually, before we get into that story, I, I wanted to share with you um, a, a little detail uh, about phrases. So, um, you know, as I was thinking about this talk and, and how to, um, you know, phrase it to you, I started noticing in the English language that there's a brain-gut connection all over the English language. Have you noticed this? I mean, one of the favorites of my own kids is brain farts. Have you heard that? People say this? You know, mental constipation, people are using that now. Butterflies in your stomach, stomach in knots, having the gall, um, you know, spilling your guts, gut feelings, gut reactions, going with your gut, gut instincts, gutsy moves, having guts, gut wrenching, no guts, no glory. And my favorite of, uh, of all of them is cognitive impaction. Have you ever had that? <laughs> cognitive impaction? You just cannot uh, seem to come up with the word or the thought, and um, it's like it's just stuck. All right, so um, this story is fascinating. You know, um, this story was originally shared by um, Catherine Price, you can see it there, and um, in, in uh, sciencehistory.org, and I just wanted to share this story with you a little bit um, quickly. So um, this story is about a, uh, a young French-Canadian man who was standing in a, an American uh, fur company store back in 1822 uh, on Mackinac Island. If you've been to Michigan, you know where that is, now in northern Michigan. And this uh, gentleman, Alexis St. Martin, he was a fur trader, he was 20 years old, and a very hardy, uh, adventurous sort of chap, and he would paddle. Uh, pelt-laden canoes from the uh, Native American villages um, back to this trading post to trade. And as he stood there to trade um, some pelts um, that day, suddenly the person in front of him who was holding a musket, it accidentally went off. And it shot St. Martin with birdshot in the left side of his chest from about three feet away. And this close range uh, made his shirt catch fire and the everyone instantly thought he must be dead. They called for um, the local doctor, Dr. William Beaumont, uh, who was an army surgeon, and uh, he came by and um, uh, started to assess um, St. Martin and found that the shot had ripped through several ribs and lacerated his diaphragm and his lower lung and um, then had exited his body. But interestingly, um, not only did he find that large wound, which he managed to sew up, there was another smaller wound be below it that um, you can see um, illustrated in this picture that uh, Beaumont drew. Um, and um, that wound would not heal. And the, uh, the, the various onlookers noticed that after the, uh, 
the, the shot had occurred and he was laying on the ground, that food was coming out of his side, and he had just had breakfast. And it turns out that um, part of the, the bird shot went through his stomach and uh, had created this hole, and Beaumont attempted to heal the hole and sew it up and, and whatever, but he could not get it done. And it led to a situation where he had a fistula, which is a hole between the, the stomach and the outside, creating a window um, to the world. And miraculously, this plucky patient survived. And through this hole, Beaumont realized he could watch the processes of digestion. And so he decided that uh, he wanted to maybe learn some things. And so he got the patient's permission, and the patient was obliging, although there, were some, well, there was some conflict, as we'll find out later. And so he started wrapping little pieces of food around strings and pushing it in the hole. And this is months after he, you know, he was clearly going to be fine and, and so on. And so he found out all these interesting things um, because they knew almost nothing about digestion in the 1820s. Um, different foods took different times to digest. Stomach, uh, the stomach heated the food to 100 degrees but did not cook it as was believed at the time. That's how the food broke down. Um, they found out that hydrochloric acid was the main contributor, that dry weather increased digestive temperature, that human le weather lowered it, milk coagulated before digestion, gastric juice was secreted only in response to food and did not accumulate between me meals. Hunger was not caused by the walls of the empty stomach rubbing together against each other, and, you know, it's just not the cause. Um, the, the, the walls rubbing, um, you know, um, do, do, do occur at some level, but it's not hunger. Um, strenuous uh, exercise promotes the release of gastric juices, and so that's very helpful, and we should all be exercising for better digestion. But the thing that I want to talk about today and those are all very interesting findings, and you can certainly read about his findings in his, um, his book that he put out in 1833 um, called Experiments and Observations of the Gastric Juice and Physiology of Digestion. But what I'm interested in today is this statement right here. Anger, this is quoting him, anger substantially slowed the process of digestion. Interesting that Mr. St. Martin, Alexis, it turns out he, him and his brothers, they all had a similar issue with anger. They would just fly off the handle at the drop of a hat. And they, this was a problem that they had. And you can imagine a surgeon messing with your stomach all the time. There can occasionally be some emotional outbursts. And when he would get really upset, the food that they had in there, that, that Beaumont had in there, didn't do anything. It wouldn't digest. It wouldn't um, make any kind of uh, change. It would just sit there. And funny enough, this is the first time there was any established medical evidence that your emotions and your function of your brain has something to do with your digestion. All right, so um, just one quick point of clarification because it's, there's a lot of, I think, I don't know what I'd call it confusion, but um, just inaccuracy in some of these statements uh, that you'll hear in the, in the mainstream media or people talking. When you say the word gut, you mean the gastrointestinal tract, but usually when we, especially when we start getting into microbiome kinds of uh, discussions, you're usually talking about the distal small bowel and the large intestine, okay? That's most of where the, most of the bacteria are, um, and so that's um, what I'm referring to when I say gut, okay? All right, so um, let's look at the brain-gut axis specifically uh, for a second. So some people are calling this the second brain, and why is that? Well, um, because there's um, there's two main parts to your uh, nervous system in, in this sense, that you know, there's the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system, that, that is a main focus, but there's also what we call an autonomic nervous system that um, doctors will refer to as your sympathetic and parasympathetic, and uh, there's a third part of that 
portion of the nervous system which is called your enteric nervous system. And um, it's autonomic. It's, it's not something that you usually tap into consciously. So, and, and it turns out that there's some 500 million nerves uh, involved with gut-brain feedback. Five times more nerves than the spinal cord actually has. That's pretty amazing. I mean, you have more nerves going to your gut than you have going down your legs. Isn't that amazing? It's a big deal. And this has not been very well studied up until recent times. There's a lot of ways that the communication occurs. Neurotransmitters, hormones, signaling molecules, and the gut micro microbes are very much involved with all of those. Uh, it's a complex story, so they're looking at different aspects, the gut hormone access, the gut immune access, the microbiome gut brain access. All these pieces are starting to play their own special role in your health. And sure enough, I mean, we've known this for a long time, right? When you look at mental health problems and then you compare them to digestive issues, you can see that there's um, a large connection. Irritable bowel sy syndrome affects 10 to 20 percent of the U.S. population and 70 to 90 percent of those who have mood and anxiety disorders of various kinds. Eighty-four percent of individuals with a GI, you know, gastrointestinal disease, have anxiety. Twenty-seven percent have depression. So there's a, there, that's just one example of a, a large connection between these two issues. And there's more. Um, and so this, uh, this slide here um, wants to tell you that there's many factors that influence this axis, okay? And this is the specific slide is related to Parkinson's disease. But I thought it was a good summary slide for, for many of the things that, that we're looking at. So genetics plays a role. Um, diet plays a role. Sleep quality, we know that when you get poor sleep quality, you, you alter the, uh, the, the bacteria in your gut. Diet alters the bacteria, we'll get into all that. Infections, so there's different kinds of infections that can be living in your gut that alter your brain. And, um, there's toxins, there's uh, immune system players. So it's all very complicated and it's, it's taking some time to um, uh, uh, figure it all out. And you can see, I don't know if you can see that very well, and I don't have a pointer, I do have a pointer. Um, you can see here's the brain and then there's this, this uh, kind of line here, try, illustrating in just a schematic form the vagus nerve. Now, the vagus nerve is the main player when it comes to what's going on with your gut. Okay, so we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit more. Okay, so a few uh, fast facts uh, about this. Um, we each have our own unique bacteria. Everyone is different. There is no kind of universal similarity. Everyone has their own unique set of bacteria. Um, it's not just the brain interacting with the gut, it goes both ways. The gut is um, influencing the brain and how the brain uh, works. The gut microbiota um, affects behavior and emotion, we, we've mentioned that. Diets that alter bacteria in the gut may help treat um, mental health disorders, and we'll touch on that. Uh, and it's, it's pretty remarkable, actually, um, some of the, the uh, changes that uh, have been seen. Mental distress may disrupt the gut microbes, all right? So we mentioned that in the story of Alexis St. Martin, and irritable bowel syndrome is a classic example of that in many cases, not all. All right, here's a few disorders that seem to have a disruption in the brain-gut axis, okay? A long list. A lot of neurologic uh, disorders seem to have a problem there. A lot of... Um, uh, gut conditions, obviously, and then um, these various other kinds of things like chronic fatigue, fibromyalgia, uh, even schizophrenia, and the list is just growing all the time. ADHD. So there's, there seems to be a, a, a very interesting connection um, occurring there, and this is a player that has not really been addressed up till recent times. We, we haven't really looked at this um, from a, a medical perspective. And you can see here, um, um, hopefully this isn't too small, forgive me for that. Um, I just typed into um, our compendium, it's, a, it's a, something that 
It's called PubMed.gov. You can look up stuff um, in the medical literature. So these are doctors and different researchers putting articles into all sorts of different journals all the time. And so um, you can see here that from 1952 to 2002, the number of articles, this is the number of articles per year. So every year it, there's a little line. And you can see in the last maybe 10, 15 years, there's just a dramatic upswing. In, in, and I just put brain gut. This is just one example. And there was 12,000 hits. So 12,000 articles on brain guts. We're not even going to just scratch the surface today. But I'll try to give you the high points as I understand them. All right, so you have both um, a healthy gut and a leaky gut, they call it, or sometimes just um, a, uh, uh, a, uh, um, a, a gut that is um, dysbiotic or dysbiosis is a term you're going to hear increasingly. It means um, messed up microbes in your gut, basically. So um, you can have a, a healthy brain and, and a diseased brain, and these often will go together. When you have problems with the permeability in the gut, you often will see changes in the brain that are, that are problematic. Um, when you have healthy bacteria in the, in the gut, you'll see better behavior, better cognition, better emotions, um, better um, uh, um, brain, uh, per, uh, um, you know, the, the brain is functioning better, better physiologic uh, function of the brain, et cetera, et cetera. So that's what this slide is, is illustrating. Okay, so how does this work? So here's an example of, of leaky gut. And um, I just wanted you to try to understand this. So in your gut, so this is in your colon largely, you have all these little bacteria that are just hanging out and they're interacting with all these chemicals that are being put out um, by your, um, the lining of your gut, okay? And so um, when, it, when there's inflammation and irritation that starts to occur, um, this whole leakiness starts to happen and then chemicals start to get in past that barrier and, and on, the, on this upper end here is where the immune system sits. It's where your bloodstream is. And um, that interaction is actually way more important than we realize to the point that your vagus nerve is actually coming down and interacting and influencing um, these, this gut lining amazingly. Um, and that's a, a fascinating uh, study. So how's it doing this? How, how are the, how's the bacteria in your gut? influencing your brain. Well, um, here's some of the chemicals that um, they've noticed uh, influence the brain, either directly through the bloodstream or interacting with the vagus nerve. Okay, so bile acids, this is the, um, the part that, that generally is produced by your gallbladder, oh, I, I'm sorry, by your liver and held by your gallbladder and then pushed out into your intestines. And those bile acids get changed and, and, and um, uh, adjusted by the bacteria, and if it's a good method, then it helps your gut. If it's a bad way of doing it, then it hurts your gut. Um, Short-chain fatty acids play a big role. Um, High-fiber diets, which we'll look at, produce a lot of short-chain fatty acids through the bacteria. Um, indoles, um, indoles are in our food, and we'll touch on that. Um, then there's a few of these other ones that we just don't have time to get into too much. Neurotransmitters um, are, um, are obvious. All right, so um, how does this happen? So for example, your gut microbes will interact with chemicals that um, are being generated from the food you're eating, for example, and that will affect your blood sugars. That'll affect how well you respond to stress. That'll affect um, your, how, how much serotonin you generate. The, 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 the precursor of serotonin, 5-HT3, uh, 5-HT3 is a, a very large amount is produced in the gut, all right? And then the serotonin is, uh, is produced in the brain from 5-HT3, 5-hydroxytryptophan, all right? 5-HTP, 5-HTP, I'm sorry about that. Appetite, so it affects your appetite. You know, if you have certain kinds of bacteria in there, you have lesser appetite or more appetite depending on which ones. It's amazing. Um, it affects um, our tendency to overeat. Um, it affects um, our intestinal lining, which affects pain and, and so on and so forth. It affects um, brain and, and, and spinal cord inflammation. 
and has a role to play there. So it's a fascinating, complex thing, and obviously um, they're, they're looking at um, some of the connections to arterial narrowing as well. Um, that is, has a huge role to play in your brain. All right, so here's one example. We, we don't have time to look at them all, um, and we don't want to get too deep into this because it gets very scientific very fast in terms of all the chemicals and interactions and stuff, and we don't want to bore you with that. But, um, you know, gut dysfunction um, contributes to depression, anxiety, brain fog. So here's an example. So lactobacillus. So probably a lot of you have heard of that. Probiotics, right? You've heard of probiotics. Well, one of the most popular probiotics is lactobacillus, right? And so, you know, if you've ever made sauerkraut, anyone made sauerkraut before? When you make sauerkraut, if you do it properly, where you keep the oxygen out of the sauerkraut, out of the cabbage, you generate a whole host of lactobacillus. And lactobacillus makes serotonin, for example, it makes GABA, some of these neurotransmitters that are very uh, much involved with your brain function and, and just the, the total relaxation of your body. All right, so um, you can have low levels related to your gut. Okay, so um, here's one example from, uh, from protein. So, You've got 20 different amino acids that make up all our proteins. One of the amino acids is called tryptophan, so this is one example. Tryptophan is very, very important um, with mood disorders and anxiety and all these kinds of things. And it turns out that um, bacteria and um, this, the different kinds of food that you eat and some of the chemicals involved with which kinds of food you choose um, will change how tryptophan is processed. And they've now they've found over 600 now metabolites, that means different uh, chemicals that are being made just from tryptophan alone, depending on which kinds of bacteria and, and which kind of tendencies you have based on your diet and so on. It's very complicated. This influences things like melatonin, so how you sleep at night, serotonin, you know, anxiety, depression, etc. Um, it influences um, indoles, which um, have a role to play in how much Inflammation is in your, in your um, body, depending on your kidney function, and other indoles, some, most indoles are healthy. Um, and then um, kynurenin, um, this has to do with um, the energy production in your body, how much energy you have. Um, and then um, it also, uh, so this is one example um, with indoles uh, that I wanted to show. So indoles is, is just a, a piece of the tryptophan, um, which is the, uh, the amino acid, here it is. And depending on which d different bacteria gets involved, this is a different bacteria, that's a different bacteria, that's a different bacteria, it'll change the outcome. So it could be something that protects your brain, IPA, pr protects your brain. It could be something where you have a certain kind of indole produced called indoxyl sulfate, that can, has the potential to hurt your blood vessels and, and, and so on, especially in the presence of, of some kidney issues. So it's all very complicated and, um, and you know, a lot of these things are just being worked out. Okay, so, so tryptophan is very, very important. Tryptophan um, comes into the, um, the, the cells in your lining and gets made into 5-HTP, 5-hydroxytryptophan, and that 5-hydroxytryptophan goes up into your brain and is found in your brain. All right? And so how well you're generating this 5-HTP from your bacteria it, um, plays a role in, in how your brain is functioning, um, et cetera. So it's fascinating. And they're finding some of the byproducts of that both in microglia and astrocytes, which are certain um, cells that, that we find in the brain. Okay, so here's one other example. Um, hopefully this isn't boring you too much with all the detail. Um, but uh, short-chain fatty acids are made by gut bacteria when they ferment fiber. I want you to understand that. Short-chain fatty acids seem to be one of the most important uh, pieces of this whole story regarding brain-gut interactions and healthy gut. When you think about a healthy gut, healthy microbiome, you cannot neglect short-chain fatty acids. It's extremely important. And we know that fiber, um, as it turns out, is extremely important with that. Um, fiber is only found in plants, okay? So um, think about when you're sitting at your next meal, where is this food coming from? You know, and um, it can sometimes be a struggle to figure out where is this coming from, you know? 
Um, we've, we've obscured some of that in some of our manufacturing processes. You have to kind of do some research sometimes to figure out where the food comes from. If it, if it hasn't been processed uh, in any particular way and it, it comes out of the ground or you pick it off the tree, it has fiber by definition, all right? It has fiber. And fiber is originally defined as that which you don't digest. But it's much more complicated than that. Um, hopefully, um, you've had some talks on fiber. Um, Short-chain fatty acids um, are good for the gut. Um, they strengthen the microbes. They stop the leaky gut. Um, they improve the lining. They um, improve inflammation. Um, and they go to your brain. Um, they regulate your appetite. They improve the blood-brain barrier. They improve brain fog. They improve learning and memory. And they interfere with beta amyloid, which um, has to do with um, cognitive dysfunction and, you know, Alzheimer's. And so um, that's something that's um, going to be explored um, much more in the future, I'm sure. All right, so what contributes to this disruption of your brain-gut axis? So let's try to simplify it a little bit, um, take a little, you know, kind of higher, you know, broader view, um, just to make it a little more understandable. All right, so here's a list of some of the things. This is not comprehensive, but here's some of the key features that play a role in the kind of bacteria and the kind of situation you have going on in your gut that turns out is very influential on your brain. Okay, how were you born? Naturally or C-section? That's important. Were you breast or bottle fed? So how the baby starts out getting its initial bacteria into the gut, you know, did it get it through skin microbes? Did it get it through um, the, uh, the birth canal? Um, how did it all start? How many doses of antibiotics were given to the kids through their upbringing? If they got frequent antibiotics, that um, may have hurt the uh, situation. Um, diet, obviously, is extremely important, and we'll look at that more. Um, fasting, We've, we're learning that intermittent fasting um, is very good for the gut microbes. Um, and uh, we're, we're also learning that um, uh, water fasting. So they did a study on water fasting showing that um, seven days of water fasting um, in one small study um, in reduced the bacteria Fusobacterium, which promotes colon cancer. So we know that how much you eat, when you overeat, it seems to hurt your microbes. Um, and not only does it give you insulin resistance, which um, hurts your blood sugars by overeating, instant in insulin resistance for that, uh, in that matter. But it gives you um, a problem with your microbes if you tend to overeat. And so um, trying to resist the urge to have seconds and thirds is a good thing. It's not easy. It takes uh, a lot of uh, effort and sometimes a lot of prayer um, to, uh, to try to overcome that. But we urge that upon you. Please try not to overeat. It, it, it improves your gut. Okay, did I look at everything? Oh, prebiotics and probiotics. So um, we'll look at this a little bit more in a second. And then unhealthy levels of stress. It turns out that this is very, very important for your gut. And um, maybe a connection with a number of different um, illnesses, um, as, as it turns out. And we'll, we'll um, talk about that in a second. Now, one thing I wanted to say about antibiotics. You know, antibiotics I just spoke of negatively there. Um, antibiotics can be life-saving, right? And I don't want to um, lead you to the idea that we should never use antibiotics. That's not true. Um, there are times even with certain kinds of situations in the, in the gut. I remember speaking with a retired uh, gastroenterologist and, um, named Roger Greenlaw that he was finding through his in-depth study that there were certain kinds of um, bugs and bacteria that would get into the gut that you had to find a way to take care of if you really wanted to improve their microbiome. Some of them are very resistant to diet changes and so on. They just stick around there and they, they wreak havoc in the gut. And so he would occasionally use antibiotics, for example, with his Crohn's patients who had some of these bad bacteria. And sometimes it would help and sometimes it wouldn't, okay? So you have to be, uh, we have to be a little more discerning, I think, and careful with antibiotics. We shouldn't just give it out for any willy-nilly cold or, or, or upper respiratory infection or whatever. We need to be careful, okay? 
because of, of the way it could inf influence your gut. All right, so um, this looks at the same thing. Um, it looks a little bit more at um, the influence of mom on your gut. How stressed out was mom when she was pregnant with you? How did she eat? Did she have problems with infections or other stressors on her body? Um, and, and so on, we've, we've touched on, on these other ones. Um, your pets, um, we know that, that your family environment growing up plays a role, um, and, and genetics, of course. Uh, here, here's an interesting fact. Um, the average two-year-old has had almost three courses of antibiotics um, already in their life, and the average 10-year-old has already had almost 11 courses of antibiotics in America. All right, so we, we probably have overdone that, and we need to back off um, some, I think. Okay, so um, <laughs> I called this gut bacteria explosion. You know, it's an only explosion because we're just learning about it. It's always been there, right? But uh, in 1996, we knew about 400 different kinds of bacteria in your gut. And then by 2017, they had um, gone up to t over 2,000, um, around 2,000. And then um, by 2021, it's now jumped almost 5,000 now. And um, it's interesting to see these researchers going all around the world, collecting stool samples, trying to find all the bacteria. And it's, it's a wide variety of stuff. I mean, we haven't even scratched the surface, uh, you know, for 4,600 different bacteria, and they each have their own little uh, mechanisms that create all sorts of different kinds of chemicals that will influence your body in all these different ways. I mean, we haven't even scratched the surface to understand that. I mean, it's a, it's a vast field of knowledge that is going to be extremely interesting to fully uh, uh, uncover as we go. Okay, I mentioned dysbiosis. I want you to understand this. Um, it's a medical condition. It's starting to be used uh, more commonly. It's where you have these imbalances in, in the, your gut with the microbes. And um, um, it, I think it's an important issue, and it influences a lot of different conditions. Okay, so um, a little more detail on your gut versus my gut, right? Um, we have high variability between each other. Um, a type of bacteria that is 5% in one sample um, is 0.05% in another sample, okay? And so there's a large variation that's, that occurs. There's a lot of different kinds of bacteria, but the two um, major phyla, you can see them here, we don't have to get into all that, but um, you know, the phyla is, is sort of pretty high on, on the, the ordering if you've ever done biology. Okay, so there's a large number of different bacteria and, and, and other, you know, uh, other microbes that we haven't even hardly touched on, um, but we, we seem to be particularly interested in the bacteria. Okay, so what makes a great microbiome? Hopefully you've studied this a little bit, but um, I found it very, very interesting when, uh, when I was reading papers and reading articles about the Hadza people. Hadza people live in northern Tanzania, and they're, they're only about 2,000 strong at this point because the modern world has, has taken many of them away from their traditional life. But they're nomadic people that just go around, <laughs> basically much, much of their life is spent um, looking for food. And because it's a tropical part of the world, um, they've learned how to eat many different kinds of foods. Um, they eat over 100 grams of fiber a day. The average American eats like 15 to 25 maybe. Um, they eat over 600 different varieties of plants. I had a patient, I was telling a patient about this the other day, and she's like, I think I eat less than 10 different kinds of foods. <laughs> I was like, that's not good. I think uh, the American situation allows for that. I remember being astonished a couple years ago. It was, you know, the middle of December, January, and we still had blueberries, right? Have, did you ever kind of Notice that we have fruit all year long, round now, right? Years ago, it didn't happen like that. We have whatever food we want, pretty much, and, and so we tend to go for our favorites, right? And then we can kind of get stuck in these very narrow diets, and that's not good. We need much more variety than we consume in America. The average American eats less than 50 foods. That's not good. We need to 
increase that because the Hadza people have the best guts in the world. Um, they have 40% more gut diversity, so that's turning out to be a very good thing. The more diversity of the bacteria, the, the larger numbers that you have in your own gut, the better. With no one species dominating another, they're all working together. Um, they, they've noticed seasonal variation in their research, so the vast majority of the time um, they're eating plant foods, whole plant foods, because of the tropical setting. But there's, there's a wet season and a dry season in much of Africa, and so when the dry season comes, it's, it's rather short, it's not that long, but um, you know, they'll start to run out of plant food, and so they will um, have to go ahead and, and kill some animals there for a little while. And when they start eating a, a largely animal-based diet, their gut bacteria diversity begins to shrink down substantially. And then it'll increase again once the wet season starts and they start getting some of these other foods back. And they have an extremely high levels of short-chain fatty acids, very, very high, way higher than Americans. Okay, so lessons from that and other lessons from other studies, um, and here's the summary ideas. Eat a large variety of whole plant foods, okay? The, the, the more variety you have in your overall diet, not necessarily with each meal, just maybe four or five or, or so different things, you know, max with each meal, but in terms of your overall diet, from meal to meal to meal, get variety. Try to increase that over time. You remember maybe um, years ago, I remember, um, you know, when, when my grandparents had, a, had a, um, a garden on my dad's side, you know, there'd be kind of seasons of eating, right? You would, you would harvest a certain, you know, crop, and then you'd eat that a lot for a while, right? You remember those days? And then you'd harvest another, another crop, and then you'd eat that for a while. Well, we're, we've, we were kind of losing that now, right? We're not doing those kinds of you know, eating more of something and then we kind of move to the next thing. I think that that's very healthy to have that, that greater variety. Um, uh, high fiber, so we've talked about that already. Um, heavy exposure to natural settings. There's probably some benefit with exposing yourself to the dirt and so on. Um, maybe, maybe that improves your gut microbi microbiome. That, that's certainly something that's being studied right now. Um, small changes in diet, not enough. So they've done studies show, you know, where they had people just take um, Metamucil and to see if that transformed the gut. Well, it doesn't. It, it, it just barely changes it. You have to make much larger changes where you go from you know, 20 grams of fiber up to 40 grams of fiber. That would be much, much better. All right? So these large improvements. And, and I wouldn't do that fast, just slow incremental improvements. Um, in, in, you know, to get your gut in, in order. Um, you know, gut bacteria um, will decrease in diversity um, it, the more carnivorous you get, so um, eating more plants, more fiber. Um, it's interesting, the, the, the rural um, is better than the urban in, in industrialized countries in terms of gut diversity and so on, but not in the case, it's not the case if it's not industrial. So it seems like there's a, there's a better variety of diet in, in some of these um, third world countries or developing countries still. Hopefully that improves in the urban centers than in the rural, but that's not the case here. Um, the rural centers have better guts than the, than the people living in the cities. Um, you know, be careful with antibiotics, um, food additives, um, we're learning quite a bit about that. Um, there's, a, there's a lot more that we need to learn here. Um, these food additives, here's a couple examples. The, the list is probably going to grow a lot bigger. Titanium dioxide, um, polysorbate 80, carboxymethylcellulose. Um, there's all these food additives that the manufacturers have been putting in to make the powdered, um, you know, the powder in the box not clump or to make it so that the, the, the oil and the water um, in whatever a mixture uh, you know, of, the f of the food product that it is doesn't separate. They have all these things that are trying to accomplish to make the food more attractive to you, but it's, it's hurting our guts in some cases, and we need to figure out more about that. Um, toxins. Um, here's one example of a toxin that we know. Um, so there's one dioxin called um, TCDD has a very long name, tetrachloro 
dibenzo, P dioxin, etc. Um, that um, we know that um, causes leaky gut, and they believe there's a connection to autoimmune disease in, with that um, particular toxin. All right, and that's in our environment, and it's it's unfortunately uh, was was you know the levels were were getting quite high in the 90s and. Um, there is some evidence that maybe that's dropping a little bit now. Hopefully that's the case. Um, avoid unhealthy levels of stress. We'll get to that. Okay, so let's look at um, dietary factors. Okay, so they've done a number of studies on this now. A Mediterranean diet improves your gut. And, and there's a whole bunch of details that we can go through, but I'm, we'll just uh, skip through that um, because of you know, time. So it improves your gut, improves the bacteria. There's healthy kinds of bacteria versus unhealthy kinds of bacteria. And a plant-based diet is the way to go, okay? The more fruits and vegetables you have, the more diversity and the better function, the better kinds of bacteria that tend to grow up. Uh, fermented foods. Fermented foods tend to improve your gut. And what, the, what we're talking about with fermented foods is foods that have a, 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 are, are very aggressive in, in producing healthy bacteria. Okay, so it's bacteria. It's not like a vinegar-based food. Vinegar would tend to reduce it. So those kind of foods would be things like certain kinds of yogurts, um, certain kinds of sauerkraut, for example, I mentioned. Um, kimchi um, is more of an Asian delicacy. Um, there's, there's a whole bunch of these kind of traditional foods where they've done a kombucha, seems to be getting some playtime. We'll see how that turns out. Um, you have to be very careful, though, that you do it right, right? I mean, if you know something about sauerkraut, if you do sauerkraut wrong, what happens? Not only does it taste terrible, but you grow a lot of unhealthy bacteria. And so, generally speaking, it has to be grown in an anaerobic environment, meaning no oxygen. All right? So those, that's the kind of fermented food you want. No oxygen, fermented, and growing the, the healthy bacteria. And it can be very helpful. That fermented foods can be very, very helpful as you get older, um, if you're having a lot of gut issues, and, and it may be other uh, illnesses that, that um, would be very helpful to really add in a lot more bacteria um, that, that's healthy. Um, nuts improve your, your gut. Um, we talked about fiber. Prebiotics. So prebiotics is basically food that the bacteria particularly like to grow on and eat. So that's, it's, a, it's kind of a nonspecific term in some ways. But there's certain kinds of prebiotics that um, you know, inulin and, and some of these, um, these uh, um, non-digestible carbohydrates that, that um, are, are getting some playtime. Um, those are examples. And they do a lot of, they, do, they make a lot of good healthy bacteria. Um, Plant-based protein has been studied. Um, it, it improves it. Um, monounsaturated fatty acids and polyunsaturated fatty, fatty acids, so the healthy kinds of fats seem to improve the situation. Um, make more short-chain fatty acids. And then polyphenols. I, I think polyphenols is probably uh, much more important than we realize. So polyphenols are um, chemicals that are found in plant foods. Um, they have a strong antioxidant uh, um, kind of benefit to you. And um, they play a huge role in helping to grow up the good bacteria and suppress the bad bacteria in your gut. So here's a few, uh, a list of a few of the polyphenol-rich foods that are out there. You notice instantly by looking at this list that there's a large amount of herbs and spices on there, right? You see that? Herbs and spices are extremely important for giving you your polyphenols. Um, fruits, various berries um, are very high. Flaxseed meal, very, very good for you. Excellent, high in fiber, great, um, very rich in polyphenols. Um, here's another piece of the list, a lot of berries. Berries are loaded. Um, some nuts in here, olives, um, whole wheat flour, um, prunes, curry powder, etc. So there's just a long list of these. You're welcome to, this is just uh, one piece of the list. I mean, you could, you could um, look at this a long time. And, and the more you're eating these foods, the better your gut uh, gets. Um, sorry, this slide's kind of hard to see. Um, berries versus pathogenic uh, bacteria. So they've done a bunch of studies looking at um, different kinds of berries and how it influences the d different bacteria. And sure enough, the berries um, uh, uh, reduce the pathogenic bacteria like E. coli, salmonella, pseudomonas, listeria. Um, it has a, a suppressive effect on these bacteria. 
Um, blackberries, raspberries, strawberries, cranberries, blueberries, these are all involved with this. Blackberries, Helicobacter pylori, this causes ulcers of the stomach, it causes cancer of the stomach. It, it's in like 20 or so percent, depending on which study, of Americans. A lot of people have Helicobacter pylori, so you can't see that, forgive me for it being so small. Um, but I just want to show you that blackberries, for example, suppress that. And so it's important to get your berries in and try to get a variety. All right, so what are the negative effects? So we just look at the positive effects of um, diet. What are the negative um, parts to the, to the situation? So if you're eating a lot of these kinds of things or foods, um, you're going to have negative impact on your gut, okay? So um, they just sort of looked at a Western diet, generally speaking, and it, it was a lot more suppressive than, um, you know, kind of your traditional diets overseas. Um, animal-based protein, the more animal-based protein you eat, the more it tends to suppress your, your gut um, microbes and, and um, suppress the, um, the uh, 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 short-chain fatty acid production. Saturated fatty acids, so that's, you know, almost exclusively from animal products. There's a couple uh, in plant foods, um, palm oil and, and coconut oil, for example. Uh, you know, but short chain, our, our, our saturated fatty acids um, reduces total bacterial abundance, reduces diversity and richness, okay? In increases pro-inflammatory bacteria. So bacteria that inflames your body um, starts to be produced. Um, sweeteners, um, so uh, the, the one that um, is kind of a question mark at this point is sucralose. Studies are starting to show that it could be harmful to your gut, all right? And so sucralose is pretty popular. Um, Splenda, and uh, you know, that's a problem. And Splenda is sort of a man-made chemical, so you know, it's kind of interesting. Uh, and then the emulsifiers, we talked about things that, you know, keep uh, a solution, you know, connected in terms of the fat and the, and the water, not separating any kind of, you know, products that you would get that might have that tendency. They, they may put stuff in, like emulsifiers, to keep that from happening. You need to pay attention to that and um, some of those could um, bother our guts. You know, I, I had a patient with Crohn's disease who, um, he worked really hard to get the emulsifiers out, and it seemed to have made a huge impact on his, his gut. And, and we did a lot of other things that we've talked about in improving his situation, but I think there's certain kinds of people that really need to pay attention to this stuff because they, they may be susceptible. Okay, we'll just skip through this. This has to do with, um, you know, uh, brain studies that, that were done, and, and just to tell you in, in an overview kind of way, there's been, you know, some studies, it needs more studies, that have showed that, you know, you improve their diet, the microbes improve, and the mood improves, okay? Makes sense. So we know that there, there may, in fact, be a pathway there, and sorry, that's small, I, I need to improve that. Okay, so the depressed uh, um, have different gut bacteria. So here's another angle. So if you just look at depressed people, uh, folks with depression, what kind of bacteria they have in their gut? Well, it turns out they have um, uh, bacteria. These kinds of bacteria here tend to be more pro-inflammatory. And the bacteria that are a lot more helpful to your gut, and, you know, without getting into all the details, um, tend to be low. And so, and they've also noticed that certain ones of these um, bacteria tend to be particularly bothersome to the brain, all right, in, in the chemicals they produce. And so it's fascinating to think that your gut could be messing with your mood. Um, very, very interesting. So um, here's one example of a trial where they changed the, the uh, diet, and it, it, was, it was a relatively um, meager uh, change, honestly. It was a randomized trial. It was fairly really decent size, I mean 160 people, I mean it's not massive, but it's, it's big enough to, to give you some, some fairly decent uh, evidence. And it showed that over 12 weeks, um, they, you know, they enrolled people with moderate or severe depression and they, they had them either uh, go on a plant-centered Mediterranean diet or just do social support. So just kind of talk about getting better. And, and you know, and sometimes that's very helpful. So, um, anyways, the, uh, the people on the Mediterranean diet had significant improvement in their condition, and it's at 12 weeks, um, 
32% of them were in remission for diabetes, uh, for diabetes, <laughs> for uh, depression, okay? Versus 8% in the support group, all right? So dramatically different. And um, the number needed to treat on that, if you love statistics, is four. So that, that means it's a powerful effect. Um, you don't have to give it to very many people. It uh, makes a big difference. And so, sure enough, looks like diet is going to be a treatment for depression in the future. And these kind of studies are, are showing that. And the crazy thing about the study is their fiber intake only went up by like four grams. All right? It wasn't a big move. It, they didn't go from, you know, largely, you know, American-style diet to a totally plant-based diet. They went from a largely American-style diet to a little bit more plants. <laughs> but it improved their mood. Isn't that amazing? Um, I just threw this in here. You don't have to study the, the slide very much. Just to remind me to tell you that, um, you know, this whole probiotic movement seems to be pretty, pretty big, and people are are taking probiotics, et cetera, but just realize that we're discovering more and more that there's probiotics, meaning bacteria, in the food. In fact, um, a gardener, uh, he's, he's kind of leads out, gives a lot of speeches and stuff, a uh, knowledgeable guy, he was sharing that um, they seem to think, um, the, the horticultural community seems to think now that there's bacteria that's placed in every seed that's crucial for that seed germinating, all right? Isn't that amazing? And so, um, Apple is no different. Um, this study shows that um, there are 100 million bacteria in an apple. And you're like, where? On the skin? Nope, not on the skin. In the white flesh and in the seeds. Next time you're eating your apple, you know, try to see if you can see some of those bacteria. <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's there. It is absolutely there, and the thing that this study showed was that if it's organically grown apples, um, there's a greater diversity of bacteria that they were able to grow um, from the apple, or they didn't grow it, um, the, the DNA, they, they, they tested for their DNA of the bacteria. They were able to man, um, show that they had a much wider variety of um, different kinds of bacteria if it was organically grown versus if it was conventionally sprayed. So they both had the same amount of bacteria, 100 million, but the, the 100 million from the conventionally sprayed was much, much fewer numbers of different kinds of bacteria, whereas you, know, you want that large variety, that diversity. So the organic apple is better from this perspective, and we'll, we'll see if more studies show that, but this was a good study on that. Okay, so um, just briefly probiotics. If you just take probiotics, um, studies um, haven't shown dramatic effects. Um, there have been some studies showing that it may improve depression and anxiety, and I've seen that clinically. Um, but there's some studies that um, haven't shown much, and we need more research. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a liver problem. If, you know, when, you get your, when your liver fails and you get into a situation where your brain doesn't work right from your liver failing, um, it's called hepatic encephalopathy. And um, there is some study showing that it may, may um, improve that. Okay? So there's not a lot of research there yet. We need more. Okay, so let, um, final topic here. Um, let's look at stress in your gut. Wow. Um, one of the most remarkable papers I have looked at in a long time is called Stress and Immunity. And it was a, it was a, a, a review article. And right in the abstract, it said 80% of autoimmune diseases initiate with a uncommon stress event, 80%. And you think, well, how could that be? And it turns out that many autoimmune dis disorders seem to have substantive gut changes. And when you start to study the effects of stress on your gut, you start to see some connections. And so I think that we as physicians need to start paying more attention to stress when it comes to autoimmune disease. And this is one of the lessons I've taken from this, this uh, doing this, this talk. So stress exacerbates um, the intestinal and systemic inflammation, okay? So the inflammation, when you get stressed, the inflammation goes way up. And that's part of the reason why your adrenal glands make 
steroids. Your adrenal glands make steroids, right? Cortisol is the, um, the, the, the most prominent one in that category um, to kind of suppress the inflammation, try to keep the inflammation down. I mean, you know, if anyone's ever taken steroids from the doctor, you know, that's what that's doing is it's suppressing the inflammation. And it's stress that is causing that inflammation. Um, stress um, creates a situation where you get leaky gut, this intestinal hi hyperpermeability. Um, this, you know, there's, there's a lot of debate whether it's always bad, right? There's probably a few situations where it's not um, bad. Like, for example, one leaky gut e e event is when you get a, you know, a, a GI bug, you get a virus in there, and you get diarrhea. Well, you just got leaky gut really big time, right? Because all that fluid just suddenly, you know, shows up in your, in your intestinal tract, and where does it go? Into the toilet, right? And so there, there's times when that may be helpful to try to combat um, the, the situation. And so we'll, we're trying to figure out, you know, when is it a sign that it's, that it's, that it's a problem and, and we need to, you know, we need to try to aim on that f to fix that, or, or should we just say, well, that's, that, we know that's going on, let's fix the big picture here. Okay, um, stress leads to dysbiosis, so that um, my microbe um, alteration. So, you know, when you get stressed, you are changing the bacteria in your gut. Can you believe that? It's amazing. And then it also, in, you know, alters your you know, the, 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 the amount of uh, movement of your intestines to make you have bowel movements, right? You know, it's really bad to get constipated because a lot more toxins start to enter your system. And so you want to keep the stool moving. You want to have regular bowel movements to keep that, the toxins that are generated um, in the stool, get them out of your system. So you want to have good motility. You, you know, obviously, you know, motility means the movement of the, of the bowels to... to move the, the food and the stool along, and uh, you want that to, be, to do a good job. And uh, stress blocks that, just like we saw with Mr. Alexis St. Martin, right? When he got upset and stressed and, and angry, his gut stopped working, his, his stomach stopped. Okay, so what are the major effects of stress on the gut? Um, gut motility, secretion changes. Um, the sensitivity, so um, people with irritable bowel syndrome have this, where their, their guts are very, very sensitive. They feel like they have massive bloating and they have tons of pain, and yet the, the nerves, when they study it, don't have any, any increased firing, or um, they don't notice, there may, there's sometimes a little bit more inflammation, but when they look in there with the colonoscopy, they don't see anything different. Um, and it turns out that um, stress is one of the factors that makes the nerves more sensitive um, in the gut. And that's part of the reason why some people have pain. Um, mucosal blood flow, so how well the blood is flowing. Um, we talked about the microbes. And then this permeability issue, the intestinal permeability, the leaky gut. Okay, so that's, that's a good summary slide of that. Okay, so how does this all work? Again, this has to do with your autonomic nervous system, your vagal nerve. And it's, it's both ways. When your brain gets stressed, your gut gets stressed. When your gut gets stressed, your brain gets stressed. They both play a role together. And this particular slide is focused on, uh, on uh, inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's and ulcerative colitis and stuff like that, which is, you know, seems to be becoming more common. And, um, and again, it's, it's the same kind of stuff. Um, here's the immune system cells. The uh, bacteria themselves or different products of, bacteria, of the bacteria, you know, find their way past the, the lining of your gut and then your immune system attacks it. And that creates inflammation that causes all sorts of problems. Okay? And uh, this is a great slide. It, it's got a lot on it, but, you know, it, it basically tells you that your, your brain function, your behavior, your cognition is, is very much influenced by all these chemicals and those chemicals um, are influenced heavily by what's going on in your gut. So you can see here, this is, go this is inside the gut. There's, there's different factors that are playing a role in here. You've got different food, different kinds of food factors. You've got different kinds of bacteria in there, um, different problems going on. LPS means um, the idea of um, breakdown products of certain kinds of bacteria create um, 
liposome, uh, what's it called again? Um, uh, um, uh, I forgot the name now. Anyways, LPS is uh, a breakdown toxin of the bacteria. And uh, what's that? Lipopolysaccharides. You got it. Yes. Thank you. Uh, lipopolysaccharides is what, the word I was trying to get to. And that leaks into your bloodstream and causes problems. In fact, um, lipopolysaccharides in very high doses in your bloodstream causes sepsis. I mean, it creates a situation that, you know, is, is sepsis-like. And so, um, you know, we'll occasionally see that. I remember seeing that in the hospital where someone will just come in with sepsis and you look all over their body, you can't find any reason why they would have sepsis. Except as you start studying their gut more, you realize, oh, this person probably had it from the gut. And the, the, the sepsis occurred, the bacteria leaked in from the gut. And sure enough, um, the, it's important to, to, to know about. And these factors go up and influence your brain um, through, through the various uh, methods. So it's amazing. It's an amazing system. Okay, so here's this 80% I mentioned before. Um, again, you know, more, better studies need, are needed. But that statement alone you know, is concerning. And um, it's, it's not part of the treatment protocol with autoimmune disease to look at stress. We just, it's just not done. Um, we, they're, they're, the focus tends to be other things. Um, early life trauma, you know, we know that there's a higher um, incidence of, of irritable bowel syndrome, for example, with early life trauma. And, you know, um, early life trauma has to do with things like, you know, maladjust, maladjusted relationships when you're, when you're young, so like problematic relationships when you're a kid or a teen, illness or death of a parent, abuse, um, these kind of things change your development, change how your brain develops, changes your gut, and, and plays a role with um, getting irritable bowel. And, um, and so here's an example of stress and irritable bowel. Probably um, there's a lot more examples. I mean, you know, I just think of one in my own personal life. Um, right before I got into med school, I was part of a youth group at our church, and we had a gentleman, he was a little bit older than us, but he liked to attend our group, and we, we, we were happy to have him. And um, then he just suddenly disappeared, and we didn't know what happened to him. And um, you know, we, some of the group, some members of the group tried to contact him, and just nowhere to be found. And uh, probably six months later, I get a call to my house by him and talk with him, and he tells me the story of I had the most stressful thing ever happened to me in my life. I was estranged from my father. We didn't have any relationship, and my father suddenly died. And since I was the oldest child, and none of the other children had a relationship with my dad either, I felt it my duty to go and deal with the aftermath of his death and try to, you know, arrange his, his situation and make sure everything was taken care of. And he said that when he walked into the, his dad's home, it had become just a, a total nightmare experience, you know, where his dad was chronically ill and, and just had left the place in, in, a, in a state of, of chaos. And to clean that up, he said, was the most stressful thing he'd ever gone through because of the estrangement. And when he got done with that and sold the house and, and dealt with all the stuff, um, he starts just having just this enormous fatigue. And he doesn't know what's wrong. And he goes to the doctor. And the doctor starts working him up. And he, he gets cancer. Two, about two months after that, he got multiple myeloma. And he called me to ask, and I was in between, I was going to start med school the next year, and I, was, I, I had stopped college already, and I was pending all that. And he called me to ask if I would be a caregiver for him because the cancer had made his kidneys fail, and he had to go to dialysis three times a week. And he didn't have anybody to help him. And so I stayed with him for, uh, I forget what it was, four months or whatever, um, while we were getting him back on his feet. And stress, right? Uncommon stress. 
causes disease. And the gut plays a role there. And I'm sure we'll figure out much more of that. Okay, so um, this slide just to tell you a little bit about working up the gut. You know, just because you have something going on um, pain-wise or whatever going on there doesn't mean automatically that it's, you know, a problem with the bacteria. It could be, and many times it is, but, you know, and even if it is, you should still do a proper investigation to make sure there's not something else going on. You know what I mean? For example, cancer. You know, somebody could have a problem with their gut, and, you know, and maybe they're, they're focused on that and maybe trying to improve their diet and whatever, but if they're having a lot of problems with constipation or bowel issues or whatever, you know, don't just let that you know, go on forever. If you change your diet and you're still having major problems, get a workup because it could be colon cancer, okay? And that's not going to just fix with, you know, a, a diet change. So make sure that, so here's some of the things the doctors will do. Um, they'll take a history. Um, they will um, go ahead and do some tests. Um, and, you know, they'll, they'll check, you know, maybe some other tests. And then if everything's negative, they call it irritable bowel syndrome. That's what they call it. <laughs> All right, that's, that's that. So, you know, it could be something related to your gut. And, uh, okay, so what, uh, what improves stress? Um, eustress is a much better form of stress. This is the runner's high, being in the flow, being focused on an activity that you really enjoy, and it, maybe it's, there's some stress involved, but because it's very enjoyable, enjoyable, it doesn't give any real stress in terms of the bad kind of stress. You know, what else causes, um, a, you know, a improvement in stress? You know, here's a list I came up with, just things that, that uh, you know, I think about when I'm trying to improve stress in my life. You know, uh, music, um, recreation with friends and family, vacations, relaxing herbal teas, hum humor, avoiding overwork, you know, having um, a weekly rest day, um, financial issues, inflammatory diet, you know, diet issues, sleep, exercise, prayer, healthy relationships, you know, looking at all of the details and trying to figure out what's stressing me? Is there anything I can do about it? There are, there's some stuff you can't do anything about, right? And, and of course, um, valuing your creator over creation, you know, that's important for my issues. All right, so taking time with your family here, you know, a picture of me and my daughter washing our car, you know, fun stuff like that. Um, going hiking, this is out in Oregon where we used to live, Cascade Head, if you ever have a chance to go to Oregon, go to Oregon Coast, hike Cascade Head, it's amazing. It's an absolutely amazing, picturesque um, walk. It's, it's really not that difficult. It's a wonderful walk. Here I am, um, out in nature, very stress relieving. Here are my dad and I going to Cascade Head on another day. I mean, look at the views. It's amazing. The, the town where we lived in was on the other side of this hill. All right, amazing. And that's the whole coastline right there. And you can see both sides. You can, I, I could have taken a picture and took it to the other direction. You can see the whole coastline going the other way because this head sticks out right into the ocean. It's amazing. So going out and seeing the wonders of nature, get some time there, um, relax a bit. All right? Okay, so this is just a summary. Remember, um, be born the right way. <laughs> Ideally, obviously, you can't always control that. Um, you know, be breastfed if you can. Um, you know, be careful with antibiotics. Large variety of plant food. Big, if, you, if there's one thing you take home from this, eat more variety, okay? Um, high fiber, low meat, um, heavy natural settings. Um, larger changes in diet are needed for, you know, compared to your typical American diet. And then, you know, prebiotic, probiotic rich foods are probably your best choice. And then, you know, whenever possible, try to, try to deal with stress in a healthy way and, you know, and do extra things to mitigate the stress you have. So. All right, that, uh, that concludes. Any questions for, our, for, uh, for today? Yes? So, um, I would say, what would you say is the connection to allergies with the unhealthy? There, there is a connection there for sure, yep. 
there's a connection with allergies and um, uh, problems, imbalances with your gut, for sure. In fact, I have a patient, uh, I have several patients who, and there's a random, there's a couple randomized trials now. Um, if you, there, there's a, there's a yeast called Saccharomyces, and, um, you know, in, in changing the diet, improving the stress, those are the biggest issues with allergies, okay? So, so don't, what I'm about to say, don't, don't just focus on what I'm about to say, but, but make sure that, you know, we, we, we deal with that part too, but, um, for example, there's a product, uh, a supplement called Epicor, and Epicor has Saccharomyces, fermented Saccharomyces in it, and when you take that, it just, you know, alleviates allergies in certain people. So that, that shows that your gut plays a role in allergies. That's just one example. And the other question I had was, how do you see a correlation between this and addiction, like drug addiction? I mean, a drug addiction uh, it would probably, you know, I haven't seen any studies on it, but I would expect that you would, many people would have issues there because um, people who um, tend to have problems with drug addiction tend to have gone through very stressful things in their life. And then they developed, you know, problematic coping ways of dealing with it, and that's where addiction comes in, right? And so, depending on the kind of addiction and, and the kind of details there, you know, that the addiction tends to create more stress, which would tend to hurt your microbiome in your gut. Okay, so that's how I would think about it. So. Possibly, you know, I mean, I would start with diet. I would start with you know, um, stress and diet, um, education, you know, no doubt. Um, and, and just realize that there's another mechanism that is probably improving their situation on top of the various efforts that you'll do in recovery from, you know, sometimes you have to add medication to try to help those folks depending on the kind of addiction, um, you know, AA, NA, all that stuff is necessary um, in many cases. Um, you know, the support group, the accountability partner, that is all very important. I wouldn't neglect that. But yes, adding um, diet things to give the person more brain strength, you know? Like for example, s people trying to quit smoking who have higher intake of fruits and vegetables have an easier time quitting smoking, okay? So there's definitely a connection to addiction. And, and you know, the, the smoking piece would very much be related to other addictions in, in that sense. So the healthier the diet, um, you know, that's going to play a role in how easy it is to, to keep from relapsing and so on. Yeah. Um, could age, the older you get, play a big factor, say like uh, older than, say like um, elderly stage, like in your 60s, towards whenever and that and up? And could, um, if, if in case if the uh, elderly get, say, uh, a strike, a stroke, or a heart attack and that with the connection between the brain and the gut. Could that be a big factor too? Yes, um, those are both factors. So um, there's a tendency as you get older for your, your gut diversity to shrink. So you get, you, there's a tendency to, for it to shrink and whether or not that's just age or if it's because our physiology is starting to disrupt more and more. You know, so you start having changes in, in the, the smoothness of, of the way our physiology is working and the smoothness of our gut function. Um, but definitely, as you get older, you're, the diversity of the gut bacteria shrinks. Um, in terms of stroke um, and cardiovascular disease, they've already demonstrated that those people have um, dysbiosis, so they have um, problems with um, you know, the way their gut uh, functions and, and the bac bacteria in there, for example. So, yeah. I've listened to a few YouTube videos about the microbiome, and there's a researcher named Sabine Hazan, H-A-Z-A-N, who has a book about this, uh, not a very kosher title, but she talks about feces, and <laughs> she studies the microbiome and says that a few of her patients, she studied the family in her research. She studied the gut microbiome of each family member. One kid had autism. She gave the kid with the bad gut microbiome that was too simple, one from a kid that was normal with a, a very diverse microbiome, and the kid got better, Yeah, a lot better. And she yeah. saw the same trend with some patients with memory loss, some patients with inflammatory bowel disease. And of course, the only, this was a stool transplant I'm talking about, but the only fecal transplants, the only thing that it's approved for right now is for treatment of Clostridium difficile yeah. enterobacterium. Yep. colitis, which is 
from antibiotics. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And uh, I, I suspect that kind of stuff is probably going to increase stool transplants. You know, very fascinating. It doesn't work all the time. Like in Crohn's, um, they've done it um, a number of times. Uh, there's several trials in, in Crohn's on uh, fecal transplants. And um, uh, it's probably 60% of people get improvement. So it's not everybody. Yeah, that's interesting that, that she studied family, the effects of family members. Um, yeah, so that's fascinating. So yeah, absolutely, the, the kind of bacteria you have in your gut is affecting your health one way or another. And uh, it could be producing certain disorders. Yeah. One more. Uh, what, what do you think about uh, using like enemas or colemas to uh, clean out, uh, clean yeah, out I the mean, digestive you know, system? Sure. For, I mean, for the severe bowels. constipation, uh, we definitely would use that all the time. Um, in terms of using it for other conditions, um, you know, I, I would prefer, you know, to do liver cleanses and, and cleansing your colon largely from, you know, intermittent fasting and improving your diet. Um, trying to just clean out the stool that's in there just with a, a colonic or a, a enema or whatever, I think would, would probably have a relatively limited effect. And there are some risks to it. You know, there are people who can't handle the electrolyte changes that occur with that. So it's not something you're just going to do willy-nilly. You have to make sure that, um, you, that it's really necessary. And I think for the vast majority of people, it's better just to, just to change your diet, improve the fiber, and um, try, to, try not to overeat. And, and you know, fat, you know, do intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is a wonderful tool for health improvement. It really is. Um, you know, yeah, intermittent fasting. Intermittent fasting is, um, you know, there's different approaches to it. It's the idea that you're, you're you know, intermittently, you know, cutting back on food. It doesn't have to be a total fast. So one really popular one right now is um, time-restricted eating. So, you, you know, these, you know, folks will, you know, only eat for six hours a day, right? They'll, they'll start eating at 10 a.m., and they'll stop eating at 4 p.m., and that's it. Um, and what's happening? Well, the rest of the night and the rest of the, you know, all night long, you're fasting. And that fasting time your body uses to heal your body. That's basically what your body's doing. It, you know, it's, it's something like 15% of, your, of your, um, the energy that you burn up every day is spent on digestion. So if you back off on that a couple of days a week, for example, you are going to give your body a chance to heal some stuff. And, um, and so I think intermittent fasting is a great idea. It, it helps with our own struggle with self-control that we, we, we struggle with in America. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a good practice to get into. It's, you know, and, but it's not for everybody, right? If you're underweight already, it's not for you, right? It's for people who have a tendency to be overweight, okay? And, and also who have maybe medical conditions that have more inflammation and, uh, and a tendency to, uh, that, you know, the, the fasting would help that. Yeah, yeah, eating meals, yeah, yeah. Maybe a couple meals, you know, would be a typical example. Um, the 5-2 plan is, is, is popular, so you eat regularly five days a week, and then two days a week, you just have one medium-sized meal, and then you fast the rest of the day. So that's a typical example of intermittent fasting. And um, there's research on that, and showing that, you know, you're, you're all sorts of different chemicals that normally would harm you, improve, and you improve the healthy chemicals in your body, you're lower risk of cancer, you're lower risk of heart disease, stroke. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a whole number of, of uh, research studies that show that it's very powerful. I mean, one, one study, you know, having written the book on blood pressure, there's, there's a study where they just had people fast, and after about, you know, who had, who had high blood pressure, after about three days, almost everyone had normal blood pressure with fasting. You know, but talk to your doctor. Make sure that's okay for you. It's, fasting is not wise for everybody. You know, type 1 diabetics should not fast. 
You know, there, there's certain people who should just not fast, okay? Um, there's, there's a risk if you fast longer than, ten, uh, than seven days. You shouldn't la- fast longer than seven days in most cases unless you're having your electrolytes checked and so on. You know, the studies show that maybe 1%, maybe 2% in, in some studies of those people will get arrhythmias if they fast for seven days or longer. So there's a subset of people who are susceptible to the effect of fasting on your electrolytes. And if your electrolytes go too, get too messed up, your potassium level goes too low, your sodium level goes too low, um, you could give yourself an arrhythmia. So you don't want to go that far, all right? Unless you're, unless you're being more carefully monitored and, and, and you're more careful. But, but fasting's okay for most people who struggle with the overeating and the American lifestyle. Um, do you ever get into what happened in the mouth, like with mercury amalgam fillings and root canals as it, as it uh, relates to the gut? And then the other thing I wanted to bring up is when the smart meter went on my house, my digestive got worse. When, when what went on your house? The smart meter, that electromagnetic frequencies have an impact on our vagus nerve. I don't own a cell phone, and I'm going to be moving to the quiet zone in West Virginia in an effort to get away from the cell towers, Gwen towers, smart meters, Wi-Fi, all the rest of it, because it's had a dramatic negative impact on my health, the, the electromagnetic net frequencies. Yeah. What was, I'm sorry, remind me of the first question again. What was the first question again? Um, when I talked about the mercury amalgam fillings. Oh, fillings, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm not an expert on the dental piece of it. I know that there's an active um, research effort going on in terms of um, um, the microbiome in your mouth. Um, and, um, you know, whether fillings impact that, I don't know. I don't know. That's a good question. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the, the question is, 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 is the mercury leaking? So, uh, you know, some, you know, the dentist can, can, you know, can find the mercury in there. And, um, you know, if the mercury is leaking, then, you know, it may be an issue. Um, but um, that's the issue. Is, is the mercury leaking? And, and I know, dent, you know, I don't know if there, is there a dentist here? No dentist. I, I understand that they work very hard when they, that, you know, I think they're using those fillings less and less but they work very hard to um, try to keep any leaking because that's very important to them. What are your thoughts on having the Cologuard test versus the traditional colonoscopy? Oh, Cologuard? Um, they're both fine. Um, they, they each have their own strengths and weaknesses. Um, so Cologuard is nice and convenient. You just have to turn in a stool test. Um, it certainly does uh, diagnose um, colon cancer um, very nicely. Um, it, it may have a little bit of a weakness when it comes to um, catching polyps early. Um, so the, the DNA levels may be too low to, uh, for the call guard to detect. So that's, a, that's an issue. Um, but if you follow the regimen of doing it every three years or, you know, or, or so on, depending on how your, your doctor wants you to do that, um, it's, a, it's, it's good at, at, for preventing a, um, colon cancer, you know, and, and, it, and the colon cancer may be a little bit more advanced by the time the Cologuard catches it than if you have a colonoscopy um, and they can snip some polyps, that's treat, you know, that's treatment, basically. You, you just saved yourself col- a, a colon cancer, maybe. So, um, but col- colonoscopies are, you know, troublesome, right? You got to drink the stuff, you got to have tons of diarrhea for a day, and then, you know, you got to lay there and let somebody put that thing, you know, put the uh, scope up, yeah. So, you know, it's, it, you know, the, the colonoscopy is nice because it's, you know, if you have normal colon, you, you get a 10-year uh, window. So um, you don't have to keep doing it. So anyways, they, they, they both are, are have their place, I think. So. Okay, I think we're done with questions. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for a very, very interesting presentation. Yeah, appreciate no problem. It. So be, thank you. So before you all head out, let's have prayer and uh, ask God to be with you as you drive home. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for 
this information that we were able to have tonight. Our bodies are fearfully and wonderfully made, and we are so interconnected, and one part affects the other part and without us even realizing. We pray that you will help us to depend upon you for um, all things, that you will give us wisdom to know how to change the things that we must to be healthier, and above all, to serve you and bring glory to your name. Uh, we love you, and I just pray that you will be with each person as they travel home, that you will give them safety, especially be with Dr. Stanky tonight as he makes the long trip back, that you will, um, his angels will be with him especially. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs>